Okay, thank you very much for uh, joining us and uh, myself this morning. And being the first one out on the tryout day is actually perfect for a Swede, right? Coming into to, uh, to Denmark and to this fantastic session that uh, you have ahead of you here in uh, Copenhagen. So, topic around uh, startup and using Lean in, in those aspects. I will uh, do a few highlights first. Naturally, rate the sessions. You heard that one out of uh, Jörn earlier on for the uh, presentations. So in my presentations, I will talk a little bit about how traditional existing large companies successfully can use these aspects and are already doing so. But before I start with that, I need to know the audience. So first of all, how many of you are native Danish? Hands up. 70, 80% roughly. Good. How many of you perceive yourself to be modern? That's 15%. It, it, I'm not saying it's wrong not to be modern, but I just want to know, because either you are very modern and actually self-aware and raise your hands, or actually you are really unmodern. But talking about these topics you will have during these days, I think around also for you and myself to be advocates in a modern world, driving in digital usage, driving in innovation, and exploring new things, and trying things out. Then it's also really important for all of us to push ourselves. And it's easy when you're ahead of the curve, then it's quite convenient just to continue on the path you are. But remember, the competition is always trying to overtake you. And that, I think, is also one of these components which are really important around the topic we have, have here today. And no matter if you're a traditional company, if you're a startup, or you're just an idea, that is, aspect is still relevant. What we see around us today, as we all know, is some of the biggest disruptions and also some of the biggest opportunities that ever have existed. I participated last week in a, in a session around how traditional industries are changing. And this traditional industry was actually around maps, printed maps. And you can imagine being in a business of printed maps these days. And of course, this company decided actually to say, we are not a part of printing maps anymore. And, and many of us have, have realized that for a long time. But for them, in order to actually provide foundation for maps that went into the telephone book a long time ago, that was their, a part of their starting point. And then naturally, they were disrupted by GPS navigation systems, TomTom, Tom, Garmin, and those companies. And naturally, what we are now seeing is not only one disruption, we are also being a part of two or three disruptions in the same industries, where the Garmin's and the TomToms are being disrupted by the smartphones. So we are living in a fantastic environment, and this is impacting startup, young companies, but it's also now impacting some of the big organizations and companies. And that is the interesting point, how we can use good techniques to actually assist the large organization to also be prosperous in the years to come. So if we, if we look at some of the aspects which is now happening, why this is now relevant here and now, Many large organizations today perceive things to be quite different. If you look at valuation of companies, if you think about the top five companies in the world when it comes to market cap, which is relevant based on, on the, uh, uh, the techniques we're going to talk about here today, and this is also why large companies now pay a lot of interest around this. So if you look at the largest companies today with regards to valuation, it's basically software companies. 
They are the Silicon Valley companies. They are uh, based on the uh, West Coast in, in US, many of them. If you expand it to top 10, then you also bring in some companies from, from China and from East that is coming in being highly valued. Of course, CEOs, board members, and CFOs listen to this. And they look at the companies, what they have done in order to become successful and being valued. If you go back six or seven years, the top five companies were basically, one or two could be on that list of, of uh, the current ones, Apple being the number one, as many of you know. But if you go back six, seven years, the industries that were on that list, finance, banking, oil and gas, very traditional industries. And of course, this transformation is on the agenda for boards, CEOs, and CFOs. That is also why using these type of, of techniques around lean and startup become very relevant for the larger organizations. Because this, uh, this creates a lot of interest these days. We also know that products are becoming software oriented. Not only the traditional software areas, but also companies and products that used to be very analog are rapidly moving into being software-based. Some of them are quite easy to understand that they are software-based, like a car, for example. Around Linda and the gas, yeah, of course. It, it has some relevance how to adapt that one. What we see on, in sports is something totally different, but of course, it makes relevance when it comes to how we act with regard, is it a goal or not, and those type of aspects. So if it can be connected, it will be connected, as long as we find a way how to address the value part. This is also something that is now clearly being brought in with regards to how traditional companies look upon their way into the future. What I would also like to highlight when we uh, come into the, some of the more details of the presentations is that the primary effects are big, but the secondary effects are much more impactful long-term wise. And that is also sometimes hard for traditional companies in what we're now looking at to actually judge. Because the fact, for example, if we take, you highlighted your own, uh, my, my background from automotive, if we take, for example, saying connecting a car to a cloud, that, that could be great. It could receive some very immediate, quick customer value, which is great. However, the long-term impact that has on the value chain is much bigger. But you don't perceive that, and you don't calculate that as a starting point. At least not if you're brought up and fostered during your whole career in a traditional industry. And that also goes for, for many other, other type of, of industries. So that is also something we in Gartner would like you to bring with you with regards to how, how in the organization you work and with regards to the solutions and innovation you bring forward. So when it comes to, to my presentation, I will talk around a little bit around the introduction. I will come back to some of the CEO priorities that we have in, in Gartner, because that is also important when we talk about using the lean startup techniques. What is the reason and drivers behind that? So I will highlight that. I will also talk a little bit about uh, a few industry cases, and then I will do uh, a, a summary, naturally, and then also give you a couple of, of uh, uh, quite concrete steps and action points to bring with you in order actually to foster the learning and the experience around using lean startup techniques in uh, the organization or the environment you are working. So let us go into the CEO priorities. Why is that important? Well, number one, CEOs, they have a big impact together with their boards. What we do in Gartner uh, on a continuous basis, both for CEOs as well as CIOs, is ask them, how are their priorities developing? Because that gives a very good trend what is hot on their agenda, what their priorities are, what they would like to achieve, and also, naturally, what they're being pushed by, by their boards. So when we look at 2017 and 2018 from a CEO perspective, there are a couple of things that are important on the agenda. For CEOs, 
number one aspect in our CEO survey comes down to growth. So really important for them in their top five for growth, linking in also to product improvement, and IT-related, corporate aspects, and customer relevance, improving customer service aspects. These are some of the most important aspects that comes out of, of uh, our studies with regards to what the priorities are for CEOs. Why is this important then? Well, when we talk about some of the techniques that are important to drive innovation, trying out new things, and actually generating growth for the future, then of course, it's important to know where they are heading. So growth and IT related are, for example, some of those aspects which are on a very good trend with regards to priorities from CEOs. So when we look at this on a Gartner context, what is happening now in the industry around us, but also, also in the uh, society in general, is nothing new. I mean, when digitalization, innovation, software-based products are kicking in, is this new? Partly yes, but absolutely. It's been a long journey. A number of you and a number of us in here have actually been a part of working with the web aspect, being a part of e-business. Then I know also a few of us, or maybe not myself, but a few were actually not even born down here, but that's another story. But if you then look upon this journey, there has been a lot of different aspects where a number of industries have projected that this will happen, but when we look at traditional industries, it has not been that easy for traditional companies which have had a great success year over year in traditional industries to see that disruption is coming. And now we are coming into that aspect where we are connecting people, things, and business jointly. And here is what you also highlighted in the beginning, Jan, with regards to how Google and the other ones have been working with these topics to explore and try out new things to create tremendous corporate values, both in startups, but also how these techniques are being used in larger organizations. Are we then done? Absolutely not. I mean, this is just the starting point. The big effect is still to come. That is also why large organizations these days are now also discovering that they need to be much more progressive than they used to be. They also know that their competition might not come from the traditional industries which they have been competing with for a long time. It might actually come out of other directions. Some, some of the companies which they have had as partners. And this is not a linear development, it's exponential, which means it will have a big impact in the years to come. A number of you, a number of us, have been aware of this for a long time, as I said earlier on, but now this effect is coming in and hitting the boardrooms and it's hitting the executive teams, and that is also why your knowledge, your experience in how to drive innovation and try out new things becomes tremendously important. So, when we know this, then still companies find it really hard to drive change, and they usually fail or at least having a hard, very hard time to actually comply and do these type of, of deliveries uh, and make sure it hits the customer, make sure it hits the bottom line. So a lot of, a lot of CFOs, a lot of CEOs find it really hard to, to actually deliver. And it's only close to, to uh, just above 10% that actually manage to do these strategic changes. And that's really bad if you're a CEO or CFO that is used to hitting your targets then you become really frustrated. What we also see in our surveys from a, from a Gartner perspective linked to this is actually also linked into uh, a number of comments, what is happening now when digital business is hitting us large scale. So we know that digital is transforming, but culture is a big aspect of this. What are some of the key aspects you need to handle when you're working with lean startup techniques in your organizations. That is actually a number of comments from very traditional people that never have worked with these topics. So what you will face is, for example, you take the uh, CFO. Digital is great, innovation is great, for example. However, IT spend cannot increase. We can't afford that one. 
And if, if you're working with uh, uh, a CTO or head of R&D, they say, okay, fantastic. You can do whatever you like in customer service, in IT, or in marketing, but technology belongs to my part of the organization, then everything stops. Or you can actually have someone in, uh, in the market saying, everything we do on digital or IT or innovation needs to be done locally. And then you still might be a global organization. It might also be so that the CEO knows we're behind, we need to accelerate. And then the non-executive board comes in and pushes and say, have you yet hired a CDO? And pushing that one. And then you have the IT department who say, OK, it's great with all this new stuff, but we still need to fix the, 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 the legacy of the 20 years we haven't done anything. So a number of these things, these, this is the environment you need to work in. And these are some of the comments you will be getting, we are getting, and what traditional companies are seeing. And that is also why it's so important to use uh, a different set of techniques in order to be successful long-term-wise. So, linking into why companies need lean startup techniques. I think the number one aspect highlighted around CEOs, CFOs, how they perceive value historically, how they have seen that other companies are developing, number one is trying to do new stuff with the models and structures and processes which made you successful historically will not be the solution for the future. That is the number one aspect. So when you look at these aspects, that you need to use different tools and, and solutions and processes and structures and also culture to be successful for the future is one of the number one aspects. You can try to fix that wall a number of times, and a number of big organizations, traditional ones, end up in a situation where you bring in people, you sit around the executive team, and then you know you need to do something differently. And then you lift that rock or try to fix that wall and see how expensive it actually is. And then you actually do a short-term fix instead, because that is easier, and it looks good. And then you decide to actually put it back and only fix the surface and let the next board or let the next CEO or, and let the next CFO fix that core problem. That has been successful or partly successful for a number of years. But now it is truly changing. And that is also why these techniques are important. So what we see in, uh, in Gartner is truly linked into that in order to, to change and enable digital and enable innovation, it is very much a leadership aspect. And that, I think, is just that understanding is important for traditional companies. In Gartner, we also look at a couple of different aspects with regards to how to handle traditional companies which are working both with history as, as well as preparing for the future. How do you combine that aspect? It's not an easy journey. A lot of effort and thinking have gone into that from a research perspective as well as from experiences from the existing companies. So as a part of this, in our research and our advice to organizations, but also to the practical experiences, by modal capabilities, where you're both able to work in mode one, where you're taking care of what's predictable, what is stable, what needs to be taken care of. That is one aspect, how to handle things. But then also mode two is also an extremely important part, especially when we link this into lean startup techniques, because that's a part of trying out. That's a part of doing explanatory services and also seeing if it will work, if you're able to scale it and learn from it, and if you need to fail, fail fast. And this has also been one of the aspects where, where our research and our capabilities have been brought in to many organizations in order to find the right people and the right mindset in order to actually drive these things into traditional organizations. And to elaborate a little bit more on mode one, linking it into to mode one, then you are basically in a situation where you know what you're doing. It's stable. You've done it many times before, and you do big projects. You never stop them. You know where the end goal is. 
And actually, you have a plan, you might need to adapt it, but you just need to get through. And that requires a certain type of funding, it requires a certain type of people, and it also requires a certain type of business organization to make sure that this gets through. And it's also one of these aspects that you place a big bet, and once you've done that, you need to make sure it gets through. So this is, you can say, it's a very, very important part of any large organizations in existing businesses. But also in this aspect, it is so that it might be perceived by some to be not extremely progressive. But it's still very important because it's a part of the foundation. So it's certain. It's a part of the basic. You need to have it. What is now being highlighted and visualized a lot more in, in, uh, during these past years have actually been to come into the mode two, the exp exploration part, the innovation part, where you actually are not really sure what you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to do, but you need to do it, and you need to experiment around it, and you need to learn, and also you need to know that you will not only kick off one of these activities, you will have an array of these opportunities to move forward with. The only thing you know is that everyone will not be a success. But you do know that everyone will be a great learning. And that is also part of, of a new thinking in traditional organizations. And also that you're, you're having much quicker loops how to actually work with these topics in order to get this energy into the organization, get the the findings, get the opportunities up on the table, discuss it, see if it adds value to your customers, and then if you see that that is relevant, boost it, enhance it, and, and, and roll, it out, roll it out and scale. So, of course, this, this is a quite important part, but linking into organizations that have been working very stable with 2% growth on an annual basis, long development cycles, and, for example, product plans that are three, seven, or nine years long for quite traditional industries. This is a revolution. And it's hard, because it's also about people and skills. So linking it in, this is a part where things are not set. And changing people's mind takes time. So this is a very important part when it, when it comes to actually changing a company. And that is what we see when we're using these type techniques and by, about bimodal. It's not only for IT or the digital or the software part. It's actually a part of changing the culture and the leadership of an organization. And that is also linked into adapting yourself and your organization for the competition you have ahead of you, which, not, which might not be linked to the traditional companies in your industry. So, many of these traditional companies, if we go out and ask them and actually see what they are doing, they are into DevOps and Agile. Absolutely, many of them are. So that is not, not a challenge. And I think you recognize yourself in that uh, aspect as well. If you also then, is it enough to actually have these aspects on the table? Sometimes it might be because it gives absolutely some incremental improvements. But is it enough? to bring you the whole way? That is an important question that more CFOs, CEOs, and executive business leaders need to ask themselves. And what we see when we, when we look into the industries and how traditional companies are, are working these days, then when they realize you need to business develop in a new way, you need to drive innovation in a new way, you look at startups, for example, in a new way, or you buy startups in a new way, then you can also look at the lean startup techniques in a different way. Because some of the companies are using these type of words. Yeah, when we're planning for the future, we need to involve our people, we need to drive innovation, we need to look at our customers, uh, we need to learn from it, we need to understand it, it's important with speed, we must go out and see what is happening, we need to be able to build, we need to be able to scale. So when you use traditional corporate languages sometimes, you, you're actually touching upon many of the aspects of lean startup techniques and also a few other aspects around DevOps, Agile, and also design thinking. And that, I think, is also part of why it is important for, 
myself and you in your roles to understand some of the traditional thinking in large organizations with regards to how to leverage some of the new techniques. But if we take these, you can say, traditional corporate languages, you can actually put that very much into the structure of design thinking, lean startup, and agile, because many of these components are actually fitting in and being boosted by these type of frameworks. And if you just take a couple of years ago, when you were talking about customer problems, for example, then a lot of organizations internally within that organization went out and, and talked in the office about the customer problems, didn't go out and look upon them traditionally in, in the real world. So I think when you look at this whole journey, both when addressing the customer perspective, the employee perspective, and then bringing it in to the lean startup aspect about looking at the product, see how we can get it up and running fast to some extent, potentially get revenues, measure it, learn from it, and then continue enhance it over time. That is really hard. Because this is hard, which goes into the DNA of many traditional organizations, which is going the opposite way what they have been used to. So when you, for example, come in to, to the aspect of of the book, et cetera, and so on around these aspects, I will highlight minimum valuable product as one aspect with regards to why it's hard for traditional companies. And I will then use an example naturally from the automotive industry. So you can, you can actually have two ways of getting to, in this case, a car. Then, of course, being in this audience, how many of you have a driver license? Hands up. You're so unmodern. How many of you have a membership in a car sharing organization? It's actually a little bit less than the ones that perceive yourself to be modern. That's interesting. But it's good. For those of you that don't have a membership in a car sharing structure, get it if you have a driver license, of course. When you look at a car, and you can actually have a different way of developing a car or a transport solution. Very traditionally way had actually been, okay, look at number one. The car people are happy with, but a semi-finished car, basically the chassis, it's worth nothing. And it's also not possible to sell. Then if you just have the wheelbase or just a wheel, basically very limited value out of that one. That is why, for a traditional industry, it has basically taken from this point, year zero, three years to develop, three years to specify, and also three years to make sure you have your sub-suppliers ready to get a car out in the market, and people are happy about it. Then when people are happy about that product, then that product usually lives in, take the automotive industry, for seven years. Then you have seven years of continuous development of that product, and you have a mid-year upgrade around year three, year four for this product, and it continues to live. And after around six, seven, eight years, it's being perceived to be unmodern. And in many cases, when you have a part of the highest profit per car line, then you decide to actually let it go and move into the next generation of vehicles. So that is the traditional way. However, if you use minimum viable product aspect to actually develop something similar, the journey would look very, very different if you would start. So one way of looking at that is actually to look at transportation and take it step by step. Ease people way of getting from point A to point B. Every one of us knows that skateboard might not be suitable for everyone, but it will kick you off. You will learn from it. You get interaction with customers. You actually get feedback what works. You know you will have accidents, but that is also why you might improve it for the next version you do. But you have revenue. You're on the market. You build a brand. And of course, then you can keep your first version. You can also keep your second version and move into the third version of how to improve your product. And finding new customer segments while keeping the others including also moving customer segments from the earlier products to the next level. And here, actually, 
for this company, you actually can have customers in this whole room because the first organization could only address a part of the structure. So, of course, this is a totally new way of thinking, and this is hard for traditional industries because it's everything what traditional industries, what have made them successful is actually to work in this path. They're being fostered in that part. All the, the structures, processors, are fostering them in that direction. And then all of a sudden, a number of companies coming up according to this structure and doing things differently. And then linking into what I said initially, the interesting part is that com many companies that do according to this structure in software, they are rapidly being more highly valued than the companies in the, in the old lane, so to speak. And that is, of course, something that is being noted by the boardroom and the uh, executive teams. And then, of course, if you look at business value, if you look at revenues, and if you look at customer satisfaction, this is a totally different journey. And that is also something which is important for you to bring with you, and what also how to advocate in the organizations you work, why lean startup techniques now are becoming much more interesting for traditional companies and industries. But remember, the important part is that not the technique as such, but rather the, the culture leadership change that needs to go with it in order to be successful. So if I will go into an industry case and highlight a few aspects around how this works in, in, in practical life for, uh, for, uh, for an industry. If you look at, if you look at automotive, automotive has been going through a number of different transformations for a very long time. Uh, automotive was partly developed uh, in, in actually in the US, but actually trying to solve an environmental problem. Anyone knows the problem? The environmental problem? Yes? Horse shit. Exactly. Horse shit. Piles this high. Smelling. In New York. Taxes in New York. Environmental problem needs to be solved, and automotive is being brought forward. Think about that, based on the discussions that is today in the world, where automotive is one of the biggest aspects around uh, environmental challenges. So, transportation, environmental problem, going from point A to point B in a better way. When that one was solved through automotive, engines, wheels, etc., and so on, what happens then? Well, it needs to go quicker and look greater. Okay, everyone moves into that transformation. What happens then? You have accidents, big surprise. Then you do the next transformation of the industry, which is linked into safety and security, both for people in a transportation vehicle, but as well as for a vehicle, for people being outside of the vehicle. Then, then also, after that, you get a linkage back with the environmental challenges, which naturally the, the automotive industry have been working working with for a long time. And then based on what happened in other industries around technology, telco, apps, and software solutions, then the dream of autonomous drive and connected solutions into the vehicle really kick off. So you can say, these are the different transformation steps in the automotive industry. The interesting part with this one is also if you would combine this with the number of players in the automotive sector, the number of big companies that are successful in earning money, because that would go the other way. In the beginning, you have many companies producing and, and servicing this market segment. But so far, based on every transformation steps, less and less and less players are still in business globally. If you then look at how these traditional automotive companies are basically structured, you can actually say that you have a core. You need to develop the, the products. You need to make sure they are working in, in manufacturing. You also need to take care of them in the aftermarket. Then you also, in the modern world, have a lot around event and online sales and so on, but you also have IT and digital solutions related to the product. In the beginning, it was only these where information technology and software were brought in then developing up into the uh, marketing area, and then naturally also being brought in as the car and the customer becomes connected. How does this link into the, what I said previously? Well, if you then look on 
how, how things are developing now in, in this type of industry, which is also very relevant for many other industries, is actually linking it into bimodal, where you have more of the traditional predictable aspects that is linked into these parts, the core parts. That is, you know what you need to be doing, it's more predictable, you cannot fail, you just need to get it through. If you then look at what, what is up here with regards to mode two, the exploratory areas where you need to innovate and be quicker long-term wise, and you don't know if you're doing right. That is actually linked in to some of the aspects around these areas, event marketing and also the product area. In these areas, you don't know that everything will be a success. And that links in to mode two, basically the areas where you bring in a different set of people. So if you look at a few examples around that, you can actually take then uh, looking at the customer aspect and how the lean startup techniques are being used in these areas with success, not necessarily being brought in as the tool from the beginning. But if you take a successful automotive company today, it very much originates out of the customer, the customer feelings. And you can take that if it links into the user interface. Without the smartphones, the user interfaces in, in a vehicle today wouldn't look the same. It is actually the smartphones, the telco industry, that has been driving the user interfaces into the vehicles. If you look at, for example, some of the more progressive brands in general in the industry, if you take Tesla, they were the ones that actually didn't look at the automotive suppliers in order to get their interfaces into the car looking the way they looked. They went into the IT industry to find players there. So it, it, it is this aspect about looking at new type of players in order to get your solutions to the customers. When you also look at, for example, how over-the-air updates are coming in. A modern car today, a generation of a modern car today, basically contains, excluding maps, around 100 meg of software uh, for, for a car that is normally out on the streets today. If you take a car that is basically being released as we speak, entering into the market, it roughly, plus minus, contains one gig of software. And that is without maps, and basically without also self-driving capabilities. So, of course, the amount of software that goes into these type of products is increasing by, by the hour. Why is that important, then? Well, of course, if, for all of us that are aware of that software needs to be maintained, it's a huge challenge if every product you have needs to be attached with a cable in order to get the latest version. It will not work over time. That is why over-the-air updates and cloud solutions comes in. But when you start off working with that in the beginning, it's a very hard aspect because the traditional companies, they don't see that aspect with regards to their leadership structures, their funding structures, how to get those solutions in place. But once you get it through discussion that that is needed, then all of a sudden you have the secondary effects where you, for example, can look at, okay, now when things are being connected, what can we do more with that? And then you are able to actually have totally different solutions being put in place and also getting totally different experiences. And that, for example, has, has led, in, in some of the cases, I, I will do a little bit of a use case with regards to when things are connected, what can you get out of it? And if we take a case where you can have a connected vehicle, where you actually do a connection in order to download software, which is great. You have a business case for that. You do that. Then when you put people on top of that, using lean startup techniques to actually say, OK, now we have that connectivity on that product and with that customers. What can we do more? And you brainstorm around that, taking both automotive people, non-automotive people, including customers around that. Well, one of the aspects that came out of such an adventure was actually around making sure that cars and people and connected. Well, let's warn people what is around them and what is happening on the roads. So one of the solutions that came out of such innovative workshops were actually, OK, if you have a car that is driving on a road and it's noting that you have a slippery road, it's icy or frosty, relevant not so much in Denmark, but in other places of of uh, the Nordic, at least, 
and, and, and partly also in, uh, in, this, in Denmark, naturally. But if you figure that one out, communicate that to the cloud, and then use that cloud connectivity to communicate that to another road user. And all of a sudden, you get a connected ecosystem. And you get real-time information communicated between two road users. And then you, as a driver, get that information in your car, saying, OK, cars that have just passed this section of the road where you are entering into have experienced that it's slippery road. And you get an alert on that. It's real-time information as a secondary effect out of that you wanted to download software to a vehicle. And it's those type of solutions that actually drive out new ways of working and new ways of culture and understanding, also in classic industries. And for those of you that might have, have uh, noted that, one of the biggest aspects around using business canvas and using the value chain, customer input in, in the lean startup techniques were actually around a connected customer and a connected car and bringing that one up with regards to connecting it to e-business. In e-business, many, many people find you order online, you ask for a shipment, and you have your home as a drop-off point. And usually then the shipment companies, DHLs, Postnode, uh, TNT, and so on, they try to deliver when you're not at home and finding many ways how to accommodate for that. Through such an uh, innovative workshop using Business Canvas and Lean Startup techniques, it was actually discovered a couple of years ago by the first one, in this case Volvo, of actually saying, OK, let's use a car as basically a drop-off point, using a digital key, using the cloud connectivity, and basically doing a trial of saying the car is connected, the customer, the owner of that car, purchases online, and are able to choose the car as a drop-off point. Using a single-use digital key that the transport company gets, and through a mobile device, are able to locate that vehicle. And that vehicle is then usually much more downtown. And also, once they've located it, they know they can open it. So you locate the vehicle, drive to the vehicle, open the trunk, deliver the shipment, and then digitally closes the car again, and the owner of that car receives uh, uh, a message. Your package is now delivered, and your car is now safely locked again. It might seem like a small thing, but I can assure you, in automotive, in a traditional company where you usually do not do those type of activities, that actually rocked the boat a little bit. And the important part is it rocked the boat externally before it actually rocked the boat internally. And per se, it might not be that that solution in general would be a huge commercial success, but it actually moves people's mind. And that is the important part. You move people's mind. It, is, it was hugely successful from a communication perspective, also internally, based on the fact that, for example, people would like to come from US to talk to an automotive brand in the Nordic, and that actually ended up being a couple of minutes uh, on, on CNN. And all of a sudden, you end up having your brand exposure in a different context than rather just to have rims or uh, the torque of the engine. And, and, and you move people's mind, both internally and externally, using those type of techniques. So linking this back in to the lean startup techniques, and that is actually try it out, fail fast, do the learnings, see how it goes. In this, what I, what I explained originally, of course, it was not a huge scale during this part. It was just 100 users. And learn from that, see how the technology works. And then actually when you discovered what you needed to do and what you needed not to do, then you actually also decided, let's scrap that technical solution because we learned from it, but now we need a totally different stability for the next version. And then you also bring it in to, to actually the agile part, how you develop it for the next level. So if you then look at these type of aspects, it is how you use these type of techniques in order to actually work with traditional companies using it, but also adapting it to the value chain and language you have in your respective industries and companies. And then the most important part is actually how, for example, a business inside the newspaper in the uh, UK 
when they have a headline of actually a car OEM moving into a totally different new space. That is actually one of those aspects where you really understand both internally and externally that things are changing. And then you can link that back, how you use the startup techniques in order to actually move a brand both internally and externally with regards to people, culture, and customer perspectives. So if you look, look into then from, from what I've covered with regards to how would my and Gartner's proposal be with regards to how to work with these type of opportunities in order to get things going in the organizations you're, you're embedded in and working with. By modal aspect, you get the companies we see are working in these areas, they get a much better interaction, they get a much better dialogue, they get a much better traction by using the bimodal aspect of having mode one, the traditional, the predictable areas, the certain areas, combining that with mode two for exploratory, innovative, and using the lean startup techniques in this area. This is a fact coming out of what we see on the market as we speak. We also see clearly that when we're doing this, this is also a great way, which is now clearly understood by top executives in many companies, that using these type of techniques is actually a great way to get a high evaluation and get a different perception among customers and the people looking at your companies. That is also why this type of techniques becomes important for traditional industries and companies. Coming back to my earlier point around the valuation, for example. And if you then look at my proposal and Gartner's proposal for what you should bring with you into your organization, both to drive internal aspects, but also to drive external aspects with regards to develop capabilities and opportunities. Number one, actually plan for, for different scenarios. You have your strategies in your organizations. Think out different scenarios where you could potentially go and which opportunities you have there. Based on that, check out other industries, your normal competition, but also other industries, what they are doing to get inspiration, to get new energy, to get new suggestions. Then include that in visiting startups, because that brings in a totally new set of people, experiences, opportunities, and a totally, as we know, a can-do attitude. The sky is the limit for many of those companies, which is great to bring with you into organizations which might have a, a very long heritage of, of culture and leadership. And then the last aspect, do the experimentation part. Drive that hard. Because if you bring this in, using the techniques and so on, you will actually get people with you internally, you will also be looking at competition, new types of organization, get new energy and blood into your, your organization. You visit the startups, you see how they are working, and when it comes to visual boards, etc., and so on, no hierarchies, you don't get the, the same type of management structures, etc. That is a great inspiration for traditional companies. And then when you combine that one into experimenting and also discovering that failing is not something that is wrong. It's actually meant to fail sometimes, because that's the biggest learning. But that is hard for many traditional industries, where people are finding out that if I fail, I screwed up the money. But maybe it is actually so for a CFO, it's better to fail early and save money instead of failing late. But that is a hard learning for many. So this is four suggestions and, and tools that, that we in Gartner can urge you to use, because it drives uh, internally within an organization, but it also most likely will generate a number of very good effects on your product and services for the organizations and companies you are working with. And the most important part is actually that green button. Don't talk about it only, but bring it forward and start doing it, because that is what generates energy into the uh, organization and generates energy to move people's perceptions and mind. Thank you for your attention. And now I know a number of you will go out and look at car sharing companies, because that unmodern you cannot be. Thank you for this morning. We have time for uh, one or two questions. Um,
and a number have been asked through the app. One question is, do these changes require uh, layoffs of stubborn, non-modern, and conservative employees? It's a fantastic Finnish-Danish question. <laughs> um, I think it's, number one, I think it's a great, uh, great question. I think it is basically like this. If you have a situation where you have those type of, of staff, then you're dead anyway. So, so I mean, it, it becomes an executive decision. Either it becomes a slow death, or you actually do something about it. And that is why I highlight, for example, these techniques now towards the end, because that is about moving people's mind. Because we should also understand that if you have a long, successful career in a traditional industry, in a traditional company, then you're being brought up in that one. And, and, and then it's up, actually up to the management to work heavily in good time in order to move people's mind and culture to avoid those aspects. But absolutely, if it doesn't work, it might be a win-win for people actually to find a great career in another industry, which is a little bit more traditional. So both yes and no. Thank you. I think we're out of time. So thank you. Thank you very much.